afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Dan Mason. I'm the Assistant Director of Historic New Harmony in beautiful New Harmony, Indiana. Um, we are in the process of admitting uh, all of their participants, so give us about 30 seconds or so, and then we'll get started. Thank you so much for all of your time today. Okay, well, uh, it's, it's about a minute or so after. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, my name is Dan Mason. I am the Assistant Director of Historic New Harmony uh, in beautiful New Harmony, Indiana. If you've never been, uh, please check out um, uh, our uh, website. You can visit visitnewharmony.com or visit the USI website. Um, today, we have uh, a conversation with Indiana Poet Laureate uh, and USI professor for 35 years, Matthew Graham. Uh, we're so glad to have him here and honored. And I'll tell you, we have um, guests from around the world. So thank you so much. Um, uh, we hold these at one o'clock so Europe can join. And, and uh, I'm glad we're glad to have everyone here. So with that, let me go ahead and Before we jump in, um, let me just uh, kind of ask you to stay connected uh, with uh, Historic New Harmony. Um, we have all of these virtual community conversations recorded at H&H &H, uh, Virtual. Um, it's our page on usi.edu. Uh, you can simply go there or to the H&H &H website to see all of them. This is actually our final conversation uh, of the summer, but we will be jumping into uh, change in rural America. And actually, I'm going to turn over to Claire Eagle for my team to tell you just a little bit about Crossroads before we get into Matthew's conversation. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Claire Eagle. I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Historic New Harmony. And uh, Crossroads uh, Change in Rural America is a speaker series um, kind of surrounding the topics of rural America and what rural means and how that's affecting us and the history of rural America. So uh, the speaker series uh, begins with five University of Southern Indiana faculty, staff, and students. We have uh, two upcoming, these are our first ones. We have reflection of a, Reflections of a Farmer's Daughter, A Farm Family Legacy, and that is August 27th at 6.30 p.m. And you can register at our um, website, usi.edu slash h and or excuse me, slash Crossroads Speakers. And then um, the next one is uh, Virgil Gus Grissom, Small Town Boy to American Hero. And that's at September 8th at 6.30 p.m. So make sure you, uh, you join us for those. Uh, there'll be great conversations, just like today is going to be. Um, and uh, with that, I'll pass it along to uh, Leslie Townsend, who is our uh, director, and she'll say a few words as well. Thank you, Claire, and thank you everyone for joining us. I won't take very much time, but I just want to thank everyone uh, that has joined all of our programs and especially the one today um, on behalf of the University of Southern Indiana and Historic New Harmony. Um, please give us feedback. We're, we're excited about these programs. We have the fall programming lined up and we will be um, planning a series of winter programs as well. So. Uh, uh, again, reach out to us, give us some feedback, and thank you for joining us today. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dan for introductions. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Um, we will have a, um, a Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, you'll notice within your Zoom that you have a chat feature at the bottom. Claire will be monitoring that. If you have absolutely any questions, go ahead and type those in, and we'll get to them at the end of the conversation. Um, if we, uh, we're, we're scheduled for an hour today, but uh, we have an incredible group of people together with an incredible speaker, and I don't want to rush anything. So I'll tell you, if we go over a little bit, I'm going to let it go over. So uh, this will be recorded, and it will be posted on our YouTube site, and like I said, on our H&H uh, &H virtual page as well. With that, let's talk about Matthew Graham. Um, during his 35 years uh, in Southern Indiana, um, he's been a res respected and recognized writer, teacher, advocate for poetry and the arts. Uh, he recently retired from USI 
uh, where he taught creative writing, contemporary literature, and worked with multicultural and international um, students in freshman composition. Um, he's also worked with and continues to work with high school students and college students uh, in community writing groups. He has four amazing books, all of which I, um, uh, are on Amazon, so check them out. Uh, with the latest one, uh, Geography of Home. Uh, he's uh, earned numerous national, regional, and local honors and, and awards. Uh, the Pushcart Prize uh, and, uh, and an award from the Academy of American uh, Poets and two grants from the Indiana Arts Commission and Artist of the Year from the Arts Council here in Southwestern Indiana. Um, before I go into the, the conversation with Matthew, let me first share one of the reasons I wanted to include him in this was because I, uh, having graduated from the University of Southern Indiana, uh, I was a student of Matthews, and I have one scene in my brain that has resonated through my entire career, and um, working full-time, going to school full-time, and uh, I'll admit it, my, I love to write, but I didn't put my, all of my effort into this assignment. Matthews coming around, handing out papers and grades, comes to me and says, Mason, this is shit, you can do better. I, I, I am a, you know, from a small town, I had never had a professor talk to me like that before, but then I realized it's because he cared and he was taking me somewhere. And when that door closed for our, our classroom session, you were there to learn and he was going to help make that happen. And I look back now uh, on that experience with, because I did correct myself after that, as one of the defining moments in me developing as a professional and hopefully, um, you know, as an educator as we have sessions like this. So um, I thank you, Matthew, for being mean to me. <laughs> Anytime, Dan. Anytime. <laughs> I love it. So with that, uh, this, con this uh, virtual conversation series, uh, we, we uh, it's been about topics about New Harmony. And I have to start with Jane Owen. Uh, I think, uh, for all of you who don't know uh, who Miss uh, Jane o or Mrs. Jane Owen Blaffer was, um, she um, had many decades of influence on our town. She brought culture, she brought architects, um, she brought a vision that resonates today. And I know Matthew had, uh, he and his wife had uh, personal experiences with her. And I have to ask, do you have a Jane Owen story? I do, I do. Um... Should I read the poem that uh, kind of was the source of the story first? Have at it. Okay, so this is from my second book and I wrote a poem about New Harmony and it's called New Harmony and it begins with a quote from the writer John Hawkes and the quote reads, the shadows of history are long here and dark. A distant sadness, a smudge of light against the golden rain trees and then shadows spreading through the streets to the fields and the river. The golden hair on an arm trembles in a breeze like a breath. Utopia lost twice here in this town mapped in a dream. Clouds build above distant church bells, the sundials darken. Someone turns to leave and all that was ever meant to be and could not happen flickers as the first sweep of rain across the screen porch disturbs the shadows, neither new nor old of this fragile harmony. So I gave Mrs. Owen a copy of this book um, and uh, she later talked to me about it and she did not like that poem at all. Um, she, she pointed out and, and she just didn't like, uh, I don't know, the focus on, on darkness and on strangeness that, that, the, that the poem kind of uh, almost celebrates in a way. And she didn't like that at all. But she did kind of like the book and she told me that she thought I showed some promise as a, as a writer. And I thought, well, that, that's, that's great. I mean, it's, you know, I was, I was honored. Um, but I, I don't know, New Harmony always struck me as, a, you know, it was an incredible place and I, and I love it. But I think there is a strangeness there, a darkness there. Uh, I think that might be part of its attraction to some people anyway. But Jane didn't want to hear about that at all. And so, but that was the beginning of my connection with New Harmony, which began in, um, what would be the summer of 19, um, I guess it'd be 80, 88 or 89, summer of 89, I believe. 
And do, do you want some background on how that started, Dan? Yeah. yeah. How, how did you, how did you, what was, tell us about your first trip here. Well, the first trip I was uh, seeing my not yet wife, Katie Waters, and I had known something about New Harmony. I did some research when I first moved here about the area. And um, she suggested we take a picnic out to New Harmony one day and, and look around. And that was my first time there. And it turned out to be pouring rain the entire day. Uh, so we spent the afternoon in Sassenpass, which was also a nice, <laughs> a nice introduction to New Harmony. Oh, goodness. Which unfortunately is no longer there. But then what happened was, uh, I guess it was in 1987 or eight, I'm not sure. Uh, the university had gained its independence and the university was also becoming more involved in New Harmony. And so the then president, uh, David Rice, uh, invited a bunch of us from the liberal arts uh, to come out to New Harmony for an afternoon and do the tours and, and look around. And he just said, you know, I want you, you all to, to dream about what, what you might want to do here, what possibilities are here. And so Tom Wilhelmus, my colleague in the English department and the chair at the time, and I th thought this is an incredible place for a, for a writer's conference. And so uh, we went back to his house, put together a plan, um, and came up with the Rope Walk Writers Retreat, um, which ran for 22 summers in New Harmony. We'd bring in nationally known writers for a week to teach classes and give talks. Um, and people came from all over the country. Um, and I think it was very successful and, and, and it gained uh, a really good reputation, mainly from word of mouth, because people loved New Harmony. It was a perfect place for that kind of thing. And we called it a retreat because unlike other conferences, we spent, we, we left a lot of time open um, for people to have to themselves, to think, to read, to write. Um, we didn't have every day packed with events and people who liked that kind of stuff really, really loved New Harmony and, and the conference for, for those reasons. Um, in fact, one of my best friends, Ben Reynolds, was on the staff of the uh, uh, Breadloaf Writers Conference, probably the most famous and oldest conference in the country. And he came out to look at it for us as well, uh, take a look at, at New Harmony and, and the facilities, and thought this is a perfect place for a writers conference. And it turned out it, it was. It was absolutely perfect. In New Harmony, um, often people say that it's about healing and inspiration all in the, at the same time. Um, do you think, uh, do you think uh, it's time for a new writer's conference, potentially? Do you think it could be, that magic could be recaptured for another 20 years? Oh, I'd love to see that happen. Um, you know, I'm not connected with the university any longer, but um, it, it, it continued for a year or two after Tom retired. And, um, and, and, and Tom was uh, the, really the driving force behind it. And the dean at the time wanted to make it more uh, undergraduate student friendly and, and give credit for it, which became kind of complicated. And I think the people that sort of took it over, oh, they felt it was, I think, too much work. And it, it, I, I believe they're still bringing in a writer in the summertime in residence, but I would love to see a, much more of a residency situation in Harmony for writers and artists and, and to involve the university. I, I think it's, it's a wonderful place for that. And, and um, I wish we would do more there. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm not really involved in that any longer. <clears throat> let's pivot from New Harmony to you. Let's talk about um, a little, let's get into the personal questions. Sure. <laughs> um, my favorite is, do you find writing easy? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no, I think, no, I think it's, it's very difficult. And, and I don't, you know, I don't, I, I think, once you finish something and you think it's okay, then it's it's enjoyable and fun and, and you know it. it uh, I don't know. It, it's a great feeling, but the actual process itself, I know. I, I write very slowly. Um, um, I, I find it hard. I find it so. I always had a lot of empathy for my students who, you know, they had to produce a certain amount of stuff by certain deadlines in the course of a semester, and I realize how hard that is. Uh, but sometimes a deadline is great, you know, you, then you have to finish something and, and get it done. But I don't think it's, it's easy uh, at all, no. So do, um, when you do write, do you do a lot of research? So like the, the poem you just read about New Harmony, 
that obviously came from experiences, um, personal experiences in the town and such. But when you tackle a particular topic or, um, or, or country or feeling, do you do additional research? Yes, absolutely. Um, it depends on a poem, of course. In, in my last book, I've got a number of poems that, that uh, took considerable research. One uh, is about Walt Whitman in New York and during the Civil War. And that was kind of fun historical research that I did. Uh, one longer poem I have is uh, based on the four quartets by T.S. Eliot. And I actually received a grant, thank you, USI, uh, to go to England and, and do the research there. And um, a number of the places that he mentions in the four quartets, we actually went and visited the towns. And so I was able to do a lot of incredibly important hands-on research. Um, I also received a grant from USI at one time to study Gaelic in Ireland and um, for a summer. And that was incredible hands-on research, which uh, two poems came out of that experience as well about Ireland. And they're all in my, my new book. So yeah, and I, I like research, you know, I, I like that kind of research. Um, how, how do your poems develop? So are you, you know, are you having a glass of wine or in the shower? Does, does, a, does a word or the first sentence or a feeling come to you and that equals I need to get to pen and paper sometime soon? What's your process? Yeah, I think that I, I again, I write very slowly. Uh, I, I think to be a good writer, you've got to be kind of obsessed and you've got to be thinking about writing all the time. You know, it's not, it's not cesarean birth, as I say to my students, you know, you just don't, you know, these things ferment and you've got to think about them. You've got to be looking at life as a writer. Um, but um, so I, I don't always do that. I've got other things I want to do. Mm -hmm. But usually a phrase or, or an image will come into my head and I'll write that down and then I'll start building from it. Sometimes a line, maybe just a line. Sometimes I have no idea where I'm going to go or what I want to do with it, but it builds from the, from the language. Other times I'll have an idea of something I want to write about, but I don't have the words for it yet. So again, it has to percolate for a long time before I actually sit down and start committing it. And then on the other hand, I get very tired of the sound of my own voice. Uh, <laughs> So I think, oh, that guy again, and I throw it away. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's slow, and it usually just comes from from a couple of images uh, that I want to work. But then now, you know, I think when I was younger, and I think most younger people are like this, I saw potential in everything for a poem. Uh, and that's good. I mean, that's how I wanted to encourage that with my students, because there is potential in everything for poetry. As I get older, I realize, mm, I've written a lot of the poems I wanted to write, <laughs> you know? <So> like, <laughs> I think I'm a lot, I'm a lot more choosy about what I want to write about. Um, luckily, I have Katie Waters as my first reader, and she is almost always the first reader of once I get a draft started, I'll show it to her, and uh, she's very intelligent, and she's a very good reader, and she'll let me know whether I should continue to work on it or throw it away, and I almost always, no, always go with her advice. Yeah. If she says, this is wrong-headed and stupid, then I say, great, you know, I... I admire uh, her judgment on those kind of things. I would imagine that um, spending time and uh, crafting um, a poem that the first time you show it to someone, in some ways you're showing them the inside of your brain or the inside of your soul. And so that, that, first, that first reading, I mean, do you leave the room or do you sit across the table uh, from her <laughs> over dinner and say here read this <laughs> it's usually over dinner here read this <laughs> i mean she can tell you know she can tell if it's got potential and i'm not you know i'm not asking her if it's a good poem or not i'm asking does it have potential is it worth spending more time on basically yes. um and she, she'll hit it right every time so yeah I'm, I'm lucky that way i'm very very lucky how has the pandemic affected you? I know a lot of artists, photographers, uh, 2D and 3D, although it's, it's a dark period at the same time, just uh, falling back into their art and their craft has actually been good for them. Ha has, has it been a bit of inspiration from a writer's perspective or? Not really, I, I, to be honest, I, I have written very little since this has started, just a couple of new things and, and uh, I don't know. I don't know why. I just feel, um, and I know Katie feels this way with her own art. We just feel kind of distracted, you know. I, 
we don't know what's coming next and we don't know what's going to happen next and we can't make any plans. Uh, we love to travel and of course that's all on hold. And so I've just been sort of, uh, I, I can't think of a word besides distracted with my own stuff. I'm just don't, I'm not that interested right now. You know, it hasn't inspired anything really. But it also has given me lots of time to read, which is uh, the fuel, you know, for all writing is just reading. So I've been reading like a maniac and that's, that's great. Have you ever had a, wor uh, a work rejected? Oh, of course. <laughs> Hundreds of pieces. Of <laughs> Are you <kidding> me? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a really quick, great story about that. Many years ago, I had a, a very good relationship uh, with the poetry editor at the Atlantic Monthly. And he kept saying, you know, well, I can't take this, but send me something else. And an editor does not do that unless they're, they're interested, you know. So I was sending him a bunch of stuff. And finally he said, you know, we, I really want to take something by you. I love this one poem. Uh, would you consider getting rid of the last line and changing the title? And then he gave some good reasons for it. I didn't care. I said, Atlantic Monthly? I'll do anything you want me to do to the poem. Right? And I said, sure. And so I sent it back to him. And oh, about two weeks later, I get a note from him. He said, you're really going to hate me, but <laughs> they didn't take it. And I said, well, OK. <laughs> so despite them, I never sent him another thing. <laughs> <laughs> That'll show him. <laughs> That'll show him. Right. Um, let's talk about, so at the beginning of the year, so 2020 obviously has been challenging many, many different ways, but uh, also we got some incredible news that uh, a wonderful professor and supporter of New Harmony and friend and mentor was named the Poet Laureate of uh, Indiana. Um, I, I know a lot of us and a lot of the people on the, the line actually took that, you know, with great pride and admiration for someone, you know, that we hold so dear. Um, yeah. So congratulations on that, but um, when you go into a crowded room, how are you to be introduced? <laughs> well, I haven't been in a, in a crowded room since I've been poet laureate, so I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. That's hopefully in the future. Yeah. That, that question won't age well, will it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Talk about, um, so in, as your time as poet laureate, um, what is literary life like in Indiana? Um, how do you think that poetry in the Midwest is seen well, in, in, in just your experience thus far? Well, it's rich. And, and you know, we come from a, an incredibly rich heritage, literary heritage here in Indiana, you know, from Booth Targan to, to Marguerite Young to Kurt Vonnegut to, I mean, incredible writers have come out of Indiana. And it's still a very rich environment. Uh, as Poet Laureate, I was part of, I was one of the judges for the uh, statewide Indiana Authors Awards where um, we judged, I think I wrote this down, I think I had 19 books of poetry to read uh, by Indiana writers that were submitted for the contest, the statewide contest. And we came up with a short list of four people and one winner, which will be announced by uh, Indiana Humanities quite soon. In fact, the shortlisted people are listed already on the website. And I was just amazed by uh, the depth and and uh, of the books and, and the richness of the of the of the work. It was it was really really good. I was very impressed. So I think, you know, poetry and the arts, in, in specifically poetry, but also the arts in general, seem you know alive and kicking in Indiana. I'm very impressed by it. Can you talk about? Uh, you just did. Um, you actually were the curator of uh, protest and pandemic. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, I did. I did two things for uh, Indiana. Since, since I, you know, I can't do all the stuff I was planning to do as poet laureate, which was travel to all the different arts councils around the state. I wanted to visit all ninety-two counties. I, I wanted to offer my services, uh, you know, teaching classes, giving readings, talks, um, whatever they needed, you know, from high schools to to retirement communities. But anyway, I, all that's on hold. So I've been trying to do as much as I can, and I did two things for. Uh, Indiana Humanities for their website. And, and one was in uh, April during uh, National Poetry Month, I interviewed a bunch of Indiana writers uh, about why poetry was important in their lives and why poetry still is important in all of our lives. Got some great interviews. And then recently for July, I did a little thing on, on as you mentioned, uh, protests and pandemic, where I solicited poems from um, 
a number of Indiana writers uh, that addressed these times right now. In fact, the whole, the whole series is called The Poetry of Our Times. And I felt these are not things we can be silent you know, about, especially as writers. And so I received some really, really good work. And, and the first one was from a high school student. Um, he's going to go places. I know it. So, and I don't really have many plans in the near future, but I want to continue that series in some way. I need to think about it. But I've also been doing some online Zooms. I did a couple of things with, with high schools. Um, I've been judging these contests. I was also part of uh, the Indiana Archive where they, it was started by Adrian Matika, the last poet laureate. And, and he just collected poems from all over the state, from anybody, from everybody. And it's all published in this huge archive that I, I helped them put together. And it's gonna be uh, Indiana Arts Commission. will have that and it'll be available to everyone. Um, so, I mean, there are things I've been doing, but I also just feel a little bad that there's so much I, I can't do right now, but we'll see. So considering, <clears throat> considering your body of work and your new role, how has Indiana shaped your writing and, and, and or approach? I mean, considering the, the local history, the weather, the, just the, the culture of Indiana, how has it shaped you, do you think? Well, a sense of place, mm -hmm of geography uh, has always been very important to me in my poetry. Uh, my, my poems are very image-based, very detailed, and, and, and a, a sense of physical place is so important to me. And so having lived here for so long, um, yes, Indiana, you know, is important uh, to my work. Um, and um, could, I, could I read an early poem about Indiana? You know what, it's, uh, if you will, just let's, let's do, if you can, let's hear a few of your favorites. Well, I just want to, just this one, and I can read some of this later, but I, I wanted to read this one because um, it's the first poem I wrote when I moved here in 1984, and it's called Indiana, um, but it's really about Evansville, as I think anybody from here will, 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 will know, although things have changed considerably in Evansville since 1984, but this was Evansville in 1984. It's called Indiana. In the town where I live, women once built P-47s in the same factories where men now build washing machines. I guess you could say it's a town of some irony. Yet the smell of war effort is still strong here. Not far down river from the moored fake stern wheeled party boat are the sunken dry docks where they rivet together LSTs for Normandy. And the bus station still breaks my heart. All late 30s science fiction it touched down in a hum of neon and everyone got off, rolled up their sleeves and went to work. I took a bus from there once for $50. And if you could blot out the video games, you'd almost believe you're AWOL or heading for some genuine horror in the South Pacific. It's a funny town. I don't mean it's a place time forgot, just a place that has evacuated itself from time. It doesn't take responsibility for its own history and maybe they need to build a monument or something to commemorate what happened to outdated aircraft and all the dead boys who flew them. We know what happened to the women who built the planes. They're doing the wash, or their daughters are. I watched them carefully in the laundromats, talking and laughing, sorting the colors from the whites, while behind us, the sky goes off forever. So that was my first take on, on Evansville. Um, and you know, things have changed considerably in, in the town since then, but I think a lot of it is still still the same, still similar. And, you know, again, I did a little research about the town, about its history, uh, you know, about the uh, the war factories that were here and, and, um, and what became of them. And so it was a nice way to introduce myself to the place. You captured it. Uh, someone who grew up in the area, you've absolutely captured it. Okay. Um, we are, uh, we're halfway through our conversation and I, I asked Matthew um, to kindly share some of his favorite works with us. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll open up for questions. But uh, again, if you, if you have a question, you can add it to the chat and we'll capture it and uh, we'll, we'll uh, get to them in a while. So um, Matthew, it's yours if you would like to share a few, that'd be awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll share a couple from, uh, a couple different books, if that's okay. Um, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd read one from uh, my third book. Um, I think because the story behind it is kind of interesting. It's called An Irish Ghazal. And a Ghazal is a very 
old uh, Persian form. And I, I like working in old forms sometimes. Uh, and uh, they're, they're fun to mess around with. Uh, and I love the fact that historically that, you know, they've, they've been around so long and, and uh, they've got such a, a story behind them. But this was a, a Persian form. And, and the way it works basically is a series of two line couplets uh, where there's a word that's repeated in each one or a rhyme of that word. And each couplet is independent of the others, except they come together to form a larger picture. And it's all kind of fake, I realize. But, and, and what the Islamic poets would do, they never signed their poetry. So they would embed their names in the, last, in the last couplet, which was so much fun to do. And so this is called an Irish Ghazal. My, my background is, is Irish. And I thought it'd be interesting to combine you know, Irish history with an ancient Mideastern form. Um, so it's called an Irish Ghazal. Near the unmarked post office, recipes for revolution were studied in amber pub light. Smoked salmon and watercress, the mill stream and moss, the ruined monastery in the mist, and the falling light. On the basket islands, we eat soda bread with sharp cheddar cheese. In the sand, a sheep skull is bleached communion wafer white. My grandfather, dead these 30 years, wheels his bicycle down a shaded lane, speckled in sea light. Trees that go black against the sky and then how soon the night. There is a loneliness only love knows. You stand on the deck in the wind watching the coast slip into the night. Beneath a painting of St. Matthew, a table of cold cabbage and gray ham is breast blessed with candlelight. Did you get it, the end? <laughs> Clever. <laughs> I also wanted the theme uh, to be food, you know, because Ireland, of course, is, the famine was such an incredible part of its history. So, but that was that was a fun poem to do with playing with the form and, and, and history and all that stuff. And I like bringing my grandfather back from the dead too. That was fun to do. Was that written at the same time you and Katie were in Ireland and she was doing the the landscapes as well? It was a time before that time. We were blessed to have been in Ireland and quite a few times, actually. And then I guess I could read a, a couple of newer ones. Is that all right? Um, this is from my new book. And I thought I'd, um, should I read the title poem? It's called uh, The Geography of Home. And the book is kind of broken. It's broken up into three sections and the first section a lot about childhood and, and, and memories of childhood. Um, the whole idea uh, or theme behind it is, is exploring all the different notions of what home is, uh, different places one physically lives, uh, also different states of mind, and also the past, I thought of, you know, uh, as home in a way too. It's a place we go back to. And then there's ancestral homes that appear later on in the book. But this is called The Geography of Home. There's no GBS, I'm sorry, let me start over. There's no GPS for the past. No way to get back to those nights spent ceaselessly watching for Sputnik to wander across the Eastern sky. Or to those days that seem now as delicate as the cellophane wings of dragonflies helicoptering over the rotting rainboat, rain, rowboat sinking in the green shade of a lost lake or as sudden as the curtain of rain that sometimes swept that lake in late summer, like a boundary between then and the possibility of now. So much lonely time measured in a place of fading light by the arc of barn swallows and the dying blue-black panic of bottle flies stuck to the yellow flypaper hung over the ringer washer on grandmother's back porch. Remember flypaper? <laughs> always walked into it as a kid, stuck in your head. <laughs> and I think I, I, a little short poem about my dad, um, and it's called, What Left With My Father When He Died. And I just make a list, the poem's just a list of, of things that, that he, he had and, and things that are, we're losing, we don't have them anymore. So what left with my father when he died? Shoehorns, pocket combs, handkerchiefs, Vitalis, wristwatches, safety razors, unfiltered Paul Malls, blackjack chewing gum, party lines, TV antennas, rotary phones, 
snow tires, retreads, leaded gasoline, and roadmaps to his dismay, I could never refold the proper way. So it's kind of interesting to try to conjure up a person through the things that, that I associated with him. And uh, you know, that stuff's all going now. We don't, we don't have it anymore. Um, how much time I have? Um, we're, um, we're fine. If, if, if you have one more, that would be great if you would like, or we can open it up for questions. Well, let me, let me finish with, with a, a fairly new poem um, that has not been published yet. Actually, it's part of the archives that I was talking about. They, they accepted it for that. Uh, I've been writing a series of, of poems um, that all begin with a line written by someone else. And so it's a line of poetry or a line of prose from somebody I'm reading. I, I, I grab it and I've been building, building a poem on the line itself. And this one is called Beginning with a Line from Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry is a Western Kentucky poet uh, and essayist. He's a nature writer. He's a farmer. Um, and uh, the line that I took from him was, I come into the presence of still water. So this is called Beginning with a Line from Wendell Berry, and it's dedicated uh, to Connie Winesapple. I come into the presence of still water, a hidden eddy of the Ohio where the October breeze drops sycamore leaves, small questioning upturned hands into my waiting hands. The dry, dry cattails, marsh milkweed, and Indian grass rattle among the bones of the shoreline. Geese in the distance leave with their repeating cries. Another autumn and a long line of many autumns spreads like wood smoke along the water. Closure is a word I prefer to use for windows, curtains, doors, not for reluctant understandings. Yet the storm clouds building now over the far Kentucky shore suggest a kind of closure, a need for rain, a solitude, a need to realize that the closing down of every wild garden, no matter how remote or fragile, contains its own insoluble redemption. So that's the newest thing I, I've got. It's spectacular. I think I speak, I speak for the entire group. Um, before we know, uh, open it up for questions, uh, let me ask the first. So um, what's that one tip that you give people who just want to be a writer to express their soul and or want to someday be poet laureate? What's that one tip or one bit of advice? Read. Read everything. Read as much as you possibly can. Immerse yourself. Uh, you know, we're all standing on the shoulders of shoulders of shoulders of giants, and and we need to we need to, to read so much and know so much about 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 the language, uh, about our culture through language. Um, so my first. That's always my first advice. Uh, I don't know if I can say anything any other writer wouldn't say. I mean, as a teacher, I always had students who'd say, well, I love to write, but I hate to read, you know? And I'd say, well, go away. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they always thought that, you know, they didn't want to be influenced. That's why they didn't read me. But I said, well, if you started writing like Faulkner, that would be really awful. You know, that'd be a big problem. And, and you know, it's ridiculous because we're, if you want to play sports, if you want to be a musician, you, you imitate the, the pros. You know, that's in, influence is how you, you learn something. And then slowly, I think you, you, you'll end up developing your own voice. Um, I think it's helpful to take uh, creative writing classes. I, I really do. I, I think it saves you a lot of time. Instead of sitting in the dark, banging your head against the wall, you suddenly have an audience of maybe 15 people and a teacher to, that are, is going to actively read your work and give you some, some feedback. Um, and I think it saves you a lot of time. Um, and I think it's a good way to learn things. Absolutely. And you can see what other people are doing. You know, you're not in the dark. And, and you can say, wow. You know, I know I, when I was a grad student, I learned so much from my peers, more than my teachers. They were doing amazing things. And I said, God, I want to be that good. I want to get better. So there was this competition, too, you know, to become better. And I think, I think a class can, can cultivate that. Um, and and there's, it doesn't have to be college. I mean, there's all kinds of community workshops and uh, so many arts councils provide those kind of things, I, you know, I, but I think that'd be very helpful. So that'd be my advice. Excellent. Um, Claire, uh, I, I assume we've gotten a few questions. Uh, do you want to start uh, posing them to Mr. Graham? 
So uh, this one is quite similar to the one that Dan just asked, but it focuses more on um, consistency. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Paula asks, can Matthew share ideas for those of us who always wanted to write but never quite do it consistently? So I definitely think you answered that question of how do you get started? What's your tip? But is there something to be said for consistent writing? Um, yeah, probably. I'm guilty of not doing it, but I always encourage my students to do it. I think it's good to keep a journal, a notebook, you know, write down thoughts, or ideas, or just, just, just phrases or pieces of conversations you overhear because you'll forget them. And it's, it's good, to, good to have that. And then um, it's just also good to look back on years later, as Joan Didion once wrote, you know, you can, you can look back and see who that 16-year-old girl was who was, uh, you know, banging on the door trying to get in and you ignored her. But I think it's good to to keep a notebook, a journal. I think it's good to try to write a little bit every day, even though I don't do that anymore. Um, I, I think I think it's good. It's, it's like it's like doing exercises, you know, push-ups or something before you do the big event. You know, it's good to keep active, keep the mind going. But then I think reading can serve the same purpose too. But when you read, take notes, you know, write down images, write down phrases that, that stick out. Um, um, I, I, I like writing well, in books that I own, you know, in the margins, uh, the places that things I want to go back to and relook at again, you know. Uh, you learn so much that way. So I hope that's some help. Uh, here's one. Um, as Indiana's new Poet Laureate, do you have a particular platform and what goals do you hope to achieve as the Poet Laureate? Well, as I said earlier, so many of them have been put on hold right now. Um, but, you know, the, the main job of the Poet Laureate is, is, is to promote, promote poetry within the state of Indiana. And since I can't do the kind of traveling and talking I want to do, uh, I'm trying to do these other things, these smaller things. I'm also in the process of, of teaching uh, a couple of classes online. Um, one is I'm going to be through Ivy Tech in Indianapolis through the library there. I'm, I'm, I'm planning on doing an online class. and. Um, uh, Indiana um, Writers Association, and I'm, I'm going to be teaching a class for them, I believe, in September as well. These are just one-shot deals, not, not a whole semester or anything. But you know, I'm still, I'm still thinking about what I, what more I can do. So it's kind of a hard question right now. Uh, so this is uh, from Lucy. When do you say to yourself, "I'm a poet"? <laughs> Oh, I think when you won the Pulitzer Prize or you become a, a poet lawyer of the United States. I, I don't know. I suppose uh, publication is certainly a, a way to validate yourself. I think once you start publishing a couple of things, I think you, you, you can say that. But I think it's a learning, I, I think it's a lifelong learning experience. I, I don't, I feel like I'm still learning how to write. I'm still learning how to write poetry. Um, I'm still discovering new, new poets and poems that I, I think are, wow, geez, that's really, really interesting stuff they're doing. And, and I, maybe I want to go in that direction. So I think it's an ongoing process. But I think in terms of, you know, validating, certainly publication helps a lot. And, and I was very lucky. I, I, was, I was published quite young the first time in an anthology. I was in graduate school. Um, and I thought I'd made it, you know. And it was an anthology of New York poets. And I happened, because of alphabetical ordering, I happened to be on the page next to Allen Ginsberg. And I thought, well, that's it. I made it. <laughs> and then I wasn't published again for maybe five years. So, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, another question from Lucy. Uh, how often do you start a poem and just stop? Just say, no, this isn't working. And that's the end. Oh, I'd say, truthfully, 80, 90% of the time, um, that, that often, yeah. Because, I, you know, I, I, even before I show it to my wife, I, many times I will, I, I'll know before I show it to her that this is not going anywhere or, you know, this is tiring. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of the time. I mean, you know, the best editor is the waste paper basket or the delete button. All right. Um, and this is a question I didn't know the answer to. Maybe you do. Um, Joseph has asked if there are any poems about the Owen brothers, Robert, Dale, or Richard. 
I'm not aware of anything. Um, are you aware of anything? About, about? About the Owens? Well, um, I actually wrote a poem uh, about Robert Owen a little bit. It's about New Lanark. It's called New Lanark. Do, do, you, uh, have it, do you have it readily available by chance? No, I don't, unfortunately. No, no. It's, it's, uh, I, I, I don't think it's really finished yet, I guess. I mean, uh, that's part of the problem. But I, I was working at it because I got to spend a little bit of time in New Lanark uh, when we were in England one time and, and up in Scotland. And, and uh, but otherwise, I, I, I really don't know. No, that's a good question. It really is. All right. This question is from John. Is there any certain formula that one has to follow to get noticed in writing? He says, I know we all want to write what we, what we want, but several people have hinted that writing certain ways will not get you any readers. Do you find this true? Oh, yeah, I don't know. It depends on what you're writing for. I mean, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're totally intent on the commercial aspect of writing, first of all, you're never gonna make any money on it. It doesn't, well, sometimes, occasionally, fiction writers might be able to make a little something. But, but if you're looking just to write for a market, then certain there, there's formulas you can follow. There's all kinds of uh, self-help books on how to write certain things. Um, I, don't, I don't know about poetry. Um, you know, what, what, I suppose it's, 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 it's important to read contemporary writing and, and maybe you'll see some trends, that, but then that you probably shouldn't jump on a trend because it's a trend. Um, I think good writing is good writing and it's, it's going to last. Um, so I mean, I don't know. That's a good question, I guess. Um, you, you got to go your own way, you know, but be aware of what's out there. Be aware of what's being written right now. Be aware of what's being published. Um, and if what you're writing is like so weird or so <laughs> incomprehensible, uh, maybe you need to, to read more or, or take a class. Uh. All right, um, I believe uh, Christopher Bloom has, has raised his hand, so I'm gonna let him unmute himself and he'd like to ask you a question. Okay. Thank you so much. Hey, Matthew. I hey, was, Chris. Uh, thank you. Hey. I see a friend. Congratulations. I thought you, I thought you were in jail. They let us do these visits over the phone. It's oh. really nice. Okay, good, good. Uh, six more months to probation. So um, I was thinking, I think about artists always as outsiders, and maybe that's not fair. You know, I'm a scientist. I don't really know. But you read your poem earlier about Evansville and your poem about New Harmony when they were both new to you. Yeah. Do you think your poetry about a subject is better when you're the outsider new to a place with fresh eyes or better when you know a place from having been there so long? That's a really good question. That is a fantastic really question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, well, you know, the easy answer would be both, of course. But, but I think, I, I didn't think about it before, but I think being the outsider with fresh eyes might be very beneficial because I think you're seeing things in, in a fresh way uh, or a new way uh, that people have been around the stuff all the time, don't see it anymore or not aware of it. So I think, yeah. Fresh eyes, which is probably why traveling is such a good thing to do for artists, you know, because you're going to new places and experiencing new things and, and taking a fresh take on it all. But good question. Thank you. Thank How are you, you doing much. otherwise? Great. You okay? Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. Oh. Okay, good. Good to see you. You too. Uh, we have another question. Uh, Christine asks, why did you choose poetry instead of writing fiction or nonfiction novels? Or perhaps did poetry choose you? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I have written some, some short fiction. I've published a few stories. Uh, I, I like, and I'm trying to write more essays. I really like the personal essay. Um, novels, I don't know how anyone writes a novel. I'm not intellectually or creatively capable of such a feat. I don't know how it's done. I think what attracted me to poetry finally was it, it, it got a lot done in a small amount of time. I like that aspect of it. I, I like the distillation of language, uh, of being to just boil it down until you get the, the pure essence of the language. Uh, and I think that's what poetry tries to do. And I, and I like I like that idea of trying to get a lot done in a small amount of time um, and making sure every, not only word, but syllable uh, is perfect uh, for, for the line. And uh, 
that just that that sense of detail just always uh, appealed to me. And I also like, you know, to hedge a little bit. I, I like I like poems that that tell a story. I, I like a narrative. So I like the combination of the two, uh, in a sense. But it's a nice, a nice question. Thank you. Uh, well, we have uh, gone through all of our questions in the chat. So I just wanted to give you guys kind of one last call. If, if anyone else has any questions, please put them in the chat. But I, I, I know Dan always has questions. So Dan, do you <laughs> have any other questions? Uh, you know, honestly, guys, I, I, I was just sitting here thinking how lucky we are on a Thursday afternoon at one o'clock during a pandemic to be talking and being uh, with Matthew and being inspired. So um, I, 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 I'm such a fan if you can't tell. So, um, but uh, no, I honestly, th those are the, the questions that I have. Um, I, unless anyone else has any others. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> could I interrupt for a second, Dan? Yeah, yes. Um, I found the, uh, the Robert Owen poem. Oh, there we go. did I read it? Have at it. Okay. Um, it's called New Lanark, Scotland, Robert Owen's Utopian Experiment. I haven't read this in a long time, so let me just take a quick look at it. The river Clyde flows as black as the crows circling above it like tiny turbines. You could almost believe the crows powered the mills built in gray stone and set in a morass as stark and sullen as a Scottish winter. Yes, there was the school, the bank, the company store, the workers' houses, the mandatory dances, the band whiskey, and the silent monitor. A two-inch, four-color-sided piece of wood suspended over everyone's workplace as performance indicator. Black for bad, blue for indifferent, yellow for good, white for excellent. The yellow of all good intentions, the blue indifference toward the black American slaves who picked the white cotton that spun the astounding profit. The River Clyde flows as black as the crows calling across it constantly, their hard songs of the new world. So that's my kind of nasty Robert Owen poem. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we do have another question that's come through. Um, this is from okay. John, once again. He says he always asks this question of poets when they come to events such as the Southern Indiana Reading Series, which he sorely misses. How would you suggest a high school English teacher approach br bringing up poetry, other than the mechanics of it, of it, introducing new writings to them? High school students? Yes, to high school students. I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the whole question. Oh, How would they? We might, have, we might have blipped. Let me try again. How would you suggest a high school English teacher approach bringing up poetry? Oh gosh, you know, I would, I would find, you know, there's these spoken word poets. There's, there's all kinds of really interesting, fresh young poets out there, and with the internet, you can find these people so easily, and just, just give them some contemporary poems that are written by people not that much older than they are. And I think the, the variety of, of subjects and, and the sounds and the music of the, of the, of the poetry will just turn them on. I think that's, that's the way to go. Just you know, start Googling that kind of stuff and finding it for the kids. And I think they'll want to start writing their own stuff. I mean, I think that's what happens. And that would be my advice. All right, that looks to be uh, the last question we have. So um, I think right. I'm done. Turn it back over to you, Dan. Matthew, do you hang out with other poets or people from the liter literary world, or is it better to, to be an outsider and take the inspirations? Uh, yeah, a number of my very good friends are writers, and, and, and they're some of the people, but they're not here. You know, most of my, my writer friends are scattered across the country. I don't get to see them enough, but we'll send work back and forth occasionally. Um, so yeah, I've got a number of writer friends, uh, and a number of my other friends are artists as well. Um, I, I like being around creative people. I, I like being around smart people. Uh, they don't have to be writers or artists to be smart, obviously. In fact, writers are not always the smartest person on the block to begin with. But uh, I like to be around creative people. I like to be around people who read, uh, people who think. Um, and so, yes, many of them are writers and artists, but many of them are not as well. Um, I like, uh, uh, as a tip of the hat back to Chris, I, I like scientists. I like talking to scientists. I, 
I like to hear their take on things and it's, it's always fascinating. When you were sitting having drinks in Baltimore with John Waters, what's the first question you asked him? Uh, <laughs> you knew uh, I would bring it up. How'd you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, he asked me a question. I, I was in the, 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 the Cat's Eye Tavern in Fells Point uh, in Baltimore, one of my favorite sailor, well, sailor bar in the afternoon. And I wanted to make this little Super 8 movie for our class in grad school. It was a parody of Death in Venice, uh, Visconti's Death in Venice. And I, I walked in and asked the, the bartender if he wouldn't mind if I filmed just the outside of the building. And from the shadows uh, came this voice and said, what kind of camera are you using? <laughs> and it was John Waters. And I, you know, it's Super 8, you know? <laughs> no, he says, I'm like, what, are you using an Aeroflex? Aeroflex, what kind, of, what kind of camera are you using? And uh, so we started talking. It turned out that um, we had a, a good friend in common, uh, Larry Benowitz, who, who just died, unfortunately. But he did most of the music and sound uh, for his, his, uh, his movies, especially Hairspray. So it turned out we had a friend in common. So we had quite a bit of talk about it. And then I'd run into him occasionally at different parties. And, uh, you know, he was a, he's a very strange, strange guy, obviously. <laughs> but he was very kind to me. He was very nice to me complete amateur and he was nice so <laughs> i love it i i it, that's not uh um, necessarily related to our other topics today but i had to include that yeah i appreciate um, it <laughs> so with that said uh matthew thank you so much uh for your yeah. time and like i said what what a wonderful uh way to spend an afternoon um uh, hearing your your works and chatting and learning more about you and your process and Congratulations again on your, your new role. You make us all proud. I thank everyone uh, who uh, took time out of their day as well. Um, Historic New Harmony works hard to um, present our thousand, thousand year history here in New Harmony. Uh, it is a living classroom. We're proud to be a part of the University of Southern Indiana. Uh, if you've never been, uh, don't hesitate to call our office or email me and we're glad to make sure you your, your time here is special, behind the scenes tour, whatever you would like. Um, and uh, we encourage you to, like Claire uh, brought up at the beginning of uh, this, this conversation, um, join in our, our crossroads conversations over the fall. And uh, we'll be sending out more about that. And then we'll, we'll do more of these virtual community conversations over the winter. So uh, we're having so much fun with it. So one last time, Matthew, thank you. And I thank everyone else. Have a wonderful uh, day and please be safe. Thank you, Dan. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you.